She is a national, as I said, leader of leaders. She is an expert in GYN oncology. Her current passions are health disparities in cancer clinical trials and reproductive justice. She is an invited speaker all over the country, having given hundreds of lectures and um, a number of different courses. Uh, she is a real champion of education. Her service work is exemplary. She's published over 100 papers, 12 book chapters, and she is the deputy editor of the Gynecologic Oncology Journal. So if that isn't enough, she, as I said, has been an unbelievable leader in the field of OBGYN, which she cares deeply about and the women that we care for. She has been the past president of the Council of University Chairs of OBGYN. She's also the past president of the American Gynecologic and Obstetric Society and the past president of my society, Society of Gynecologic Oncologists. She's been incredibly active at ABOG, uh, serving on that board for many, many years, serving in many leadership positions, and she just and continues to be a board examiner. And the thing about her is she's so energetic, she's so bright, she's so talented, and she's also so warm and so dedicated. And I am so excited to hear her talk about career development. She has helped innumerable people in the department, both past and present, on their careers. I've learned so much, and I know I'm going to learn something this morning when she talks to us. So I give you Dr. Rice, and I want a round of applause and maybe even a standing round of applause. Just the bags here. Oh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. That was more generous than I deserved, trust me. And the talk, the title of the talk today is The Nuances of Career Development. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of the last 14 years here. And I have a simple goal. Do you remember when Emily Rosen graduated? You remember that? And she announced that she was the absolutely ugliest crier ever. I have a goal. There will be no crying. That's my goal. Okay. Up. Oh, how do I advance it? Up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, up. Oh, I got it. Oh, excellent. I have plenty of conflicts, but no disclosures. So, when I think back on the last 30 some odd years, I identify myself as a doctor. And you may ask, well, why did you become chair of a department? Because, you know, let's just be honest. Um, my first 12 years here, I felt like I really made a serious contribution to the ONC division, less so in the last couple of years. Some of that's personal in terms of not being able to operate and stuff like that with arthritis. Everybody knows I have it, so that's a HIPAA violation on myself. So um, I identify myself as a physician, but there have been so many twists and turns in my career. And that's what this talk is about, the twists and the turns and the opportunities that I've had to think about and work on the things I care about. So I'm not sure I'd identify these as learning objectives, but what the hell, here it is. So I've always kind of, you know, wanted to think about the things that I'm passionate and interested about, interested in. And that's kind of been a guiding principle. You'll see that through the talk. And then the point of opportunism. That sounds like a nasty word. It's not. Things drop out of the sky. And it's important to say, Gee, I didn't really plan on that, but that looks kind of good. And then finally, lessons come in weird packages. So Ellen already gave the timeline, MGH, UVA, here in 07, sifted and winnowed for the major points for this talk. I love that, sifting and winnowing. So I finished my fellowship at the Brigham. Chip was still a resident doing a fellowship in Boston. So I clearly wanted to stay in Boston. And um, as I've counseled most of the residents when you graduate in junior faculty, the first two or three years out, you just need to do the doctor thing and hone it. 
get it right. Uh, I had a friend in Colorado, she's three or four years ahead of me in training, said the most stressful year of her career was the first year in practice. And that was true for me. And I was given a gift at the MGH because Chip was a resident. I didn't have any children at that point. I basically never left the hospital. There was no reason to. That's kind of pathetic. I prefer you not repeat that. And so Isaac Schiff hired me. Now, at the time, I was his first hire. He's a new chair. I was number six of five attendings. Think about that. I'm looking at folks now. The MGH is a, is a very powerful department right now. But I was the sixth attending hired there. There was no OB. There was no REI, there was no urogynecology, and it was just kind of vestigial. It was vestigial. Now, the major point with this is that Isaac Schiff taught me what it means to mentor, sponsor, advocate for someone, faculty. And I'm just eternally grateful to him. I left there in 93. I am in communication with him at least twice a week. So the teaching point on that is, oh my God, the importance of bringing people along and paying it forward. And then the importance of showing gratitude. I owe him a lot. He was a fantastic chair and I tortured the bejesus out of him. I can promise you that. So Chip wrapped up his fellowship and the market was saturated with colorectal surgeons. So we had to look around. We looked all over the place and Ross Berkowitz, who was attending at the Brigham, got a call from Peyton Taylor, who was at UVA. So he ended up interviewing there. And um, we, we were there 14 years, although it's interesting. I've been in Wisconsin longer than I've been anywhere at this point. And it was a good 14 years. We both had tremendous opportunity there. Both of our careers flourished. It's a beautiful place. Um, but just have to say, I'd been here a month and I was much happier here. There's something about the Mason Dixon line. I don't know what it is. I, I don't have any way to quantitate that, but I'd been here a month. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is good. I'm happy here. Now, Paul Underwood hired me. He was chair. As is the case, two career families, it's always a dog show. And the final, the final negotiation. He looked at me and called me sugar. And I'm like a Northeastern kind of girl, not anymore. Now I'm a Midwest girl, but I thought, am I gonna take a job from someone who called me sugar? I almost said, would that be brown or white? But I didn't, and we ended up going there. And what happened was Paul Underwood was a tremendous advocate. And the veneer was like, oh, sweet Jesus, he called me sugar. And then, but underneath it was someone who tirelessly supported me. He passed away this year. It, you know, he was great. So early 07, I get a call to, if I want to come interview at the University of Wisconsin. And you'll hear this throughout the talk. I'd never been here. And I thought, huh, Chip, what do you think about that? Um, and I just want to say that the person who called me was Dean Golden. He's been the Dean since I've been here. I have tremendous respect for him. I had interviewed for chair at UNC and did not get it. He interviewed me and then he moved to Wisconsin and called me up. So this thing about like life is like this little circle thing of like, ooh, ooh that, that kind of worked out. So February 14th, 07, I come here to interview. Ellen picks me up at the airport. Later, she says to me, it didn't take her long because we're fast friends. She said, you know, I was a little worried you didn't have any socks on. And the truth of the matter is I didn't wear socks for a year because I never wore socks. I just like put my sneakers on. And um, that was a little funny. And then Ellen also said, where's your luggage? I said, oh, I got a backpack on here. I have some clean underwear in my backpack here, you know. So that was the start of a really warm relationship. And then during all that interviewing process, David Kushner took Chip and I biking. That was also good. That was like effective. That was effective recruiting. So that's the story, the general outline. Now I'm gonna delve into some weird stuff. So in a previous life, I read The New Yorker from cover to cover every Thursday night. It came Thursday in the mail. 
both Olivia and Connor would say, oh, for God's sakes, it's Thursday, forget it, we're never gonna see her. I couldn't help myself. I was addicted to it. And this article came up, John Rock's error. error. John Rock, he was an imposing figure. He went to mass every day, not Sundays, every day. And then he never went again at a certain point. And he was famous. He was on the cover of Newsweek. So a bit about John Rock. He worked at the free hospital in Boston, which was built because women with cervical cancer smelled bad and they didn't want them at the Peter Bent Brigham. I'm not gonna say another word about that. Anyway, he established the Rhythm Clinic and I just have to say there was no Excel. Every woman that walked in that hospital whether they were a patient, they worked there, didn't matter had their temperature taken. He figured all this out, ovulation. He also went on an egg hunt, 14 years, 34 eggs, 211 hysterectomies. This is when hysterectomies were being done for birth control basically. And they would time them hoping to get a fertilized egg. Clearly no IRB, clearly. And the amount of information they gleaned from that was just you know, what can you say? The menstrual cycle, it's all about the menstrual cycle. First scientist to perform in vitro fertilization. He was definitely the big man on campus in Boston, all the fancy clubs. Wrote the sentinel articles on ovulation and the physiology of the human conception. And then in the middle of all this, he decides to work on birth control pills. I don't know about everybody else in the audience, but I'm feeling slightly inadequate here. And anyway, by 1951, they knew that they could block ovulation. Here's a picture of the free hospital. Oddly enough, when I was a fellow, I had an apartment there. I just add that for personal reasons. It was a nice apartment, 700 square feet. It was terrible. Okay, now the, so they did a clinical trial at the free with 50 women, nobody ovulated. But it was a felony, birth control was a felony. So one of his collaborators was in Puerto Rico. They took it to Puerto Rico and did a big clinical trial. Nobody ovulated there either. I think that's so weird. And then they presented their work at the big fancy Laurentian Hormone Conference. The title was Synthetic Progestins in the Normal Human Menstrual Cycle. They didn't want to talk about blocking ovulation because it was a felony, birth control. And remember, John Rock was still going to church every day, mass. Got married in the church that you know John Kennedy and all those other people got married in. Anyway, someone in the crowd identified the fact that there was no ovulation. So it didn't take long. Many, many women taking birth control pills for menstrual irregularities. And in fact, the package insert said, beware, you won't ovulate. That is some serious marketing. Beware, you will not ovulate. Cha-ching, okay. So getting back to the article, uh, and you can get it, you can just Google it. In hindsight, is it, it is possible to see the opportunity that Rock missed. If he had known it was an anti-cancer drug, maybe he would have been more persuasive with the Catholic Church. After the pill got approved by the FDA, there was a big conference at the Vatican, a big conference with the Pope, big conference at Notre Dame, and obviously that hasn't gone well for birth control in the Catholic Church. So once the FDA got it approved, it was approved, the chair at Yale and the CEO or whatever, Planned Parenthood opened a clinic. They were arrested and fined because it was a felony in Connecticut as well. Planned Parenthood took it right to the Supreme Court and in 1965, it was struck down that actually birth control is not a felony. And that's Estelle. She looks very feisty. And then in 72, you could get birth control even if you weren't married. Now, I was in high school in 72, and I realized that most of you were not born. It's true. But, I mean, just think about this. So in my lifetime, you know, not possible. Hmm, interesting. And then, of course, Roe v. Wade in 73. So that, when Jenny Higgins showed up 10 years ago in my office, 
she was interviewing for a job at um, in the gender and women's studies section here at UW. She's she's a PhD. I thought I remember thinking, hmm, hmm, that sounds kind of good for this whole thing we got going on in this department. So over time, we've just dragged her more and more into the department. And in fact, now she's 100% with us. And so, yeah, woo, Jenny. And so my interest in reproductive health, birth control, anything you wanna talk about related to it, you know, it's hard to be in this field and not care about it, whether you're pro-choice or not, it doesn't matter. A woman controlling her reproductive health is a money item. It's a money item. And so my passion regarding this isn't very complicated. It's just like the basic thing, women pregnant, yes or no. And so I, obviously I'm thinking all of you folks know that this is you know, something that I'm committed to. Most of you in the room are one. It doesn't matter whether you're pro-choice or not. But it was our lucky day when Jenny dropped out of the sky and she's got this big grant from an anonymous donor running this center that's just all research focused on reproductive health. And we're very, very lucky to have her here. She has a magnificent team. So moving on this whole pregnancy thing, every 10 years, the Guttmacher, which is the big fancy reproductive health group for the world and the NIH publish a paper about unintended pregnancy rates, which is the gold standard, at least it was, for judging the reproductive health of a country. Is that annoying? Am I, okay, good, it's annoying to me, but as long as it's not to you, that's good. So in this decade, there was a drop in unintended pregnancy in the United States, particularly with teenagers. Now they haven't published, I'm thinking COVID's kind of screwed up this whole, I don't know, COVID screwed up everything, but we're due to have a paper updating us on this and I'm interested. But you can see that there was a marked decline in unintended pregnancies in the United States. We still stink. If you look at Western Europe, Australia, we're still so much higher than other developed countries. But you know, something is something. Now the thing that's important here is that all women in the United States have not enjoyed this issue of a decrease in unintended pregnancy. So if you look at this, the summary statement is this. If you're African-American in this country, you've got a much higher rate of unintended pregnancy. And if you live below the poverty line, the same. This is a health disparity. And I'm sure it's the case for all of you in the room. Let me see, the poorest women in the country, if you just look at socioeconomic class, have the highest rate of unintended pregnancy. So wrong. I'm gonna to try to leave my, you know, this is actually isn't political. I just think for health reasons, having birth control available to everyone easily is just, and this is the same thing. Just a reminder about what the poverty line is. Pretty low bar. If Chip and I made $20,000 a year, we'd be above the poverty line. An IUD at UW is about $1,500, $1,600. <laughs> that ain't right. So that just kind of transitions into this. Like, I, get, I have chills. I'm so hacked off right now. I mean, that's so not right. And so health disparities. So I had that thought in my mind. Um, and then I moved to Wisconsin with no socks on. And this is an unusual state. It's great in some ways. You all know Chip and I are staying here. We love it here. Don't think you're done with me fully. You're, you know, you're not done with me fully. But anyway, African-American <laughs> infant mortality rate, it's much higher than whites or Asians. And when you look at the United States, Wisconsin, if you look at all comers, kind of in the middle of the pack for infant mortality. But if you look at African-American infant mortality, we're always right there fighting with Mississippi. Hmm. I wouldn't have really thought that would have, you know, you know, I'm always ready to damn the South. Feels good to me for some reason. But, that, you know, we're like right in there with those people. 
which doesn't make me happy. And even though the infant mortality rate is going down, black babies are much more likely to die. And I could talk for hours about maternal mortality. We've heard a lot about that. We will continue to hear a lot about that. Black women are much more likely to die, threefold increase in death during the first year of surrounding pregnancy. And again, Wisconsin, and not just, I mean, Dane County is no better. Just saying. This is published a few years ago. I keep looking for an update. The worst place in the United States to be black is Wisconsin, according to this journal, dollars and cents. At least it's not People Magazine. So if you look at the metrics of incarceration, home ownership, child well-being, child poverty, unemployment, teen pregnancy, and poverty, at this point, we were the worst state in the United States. And you know, every, <clears throat> I don't know so much about Minnesota, except I keep hearing, well, they elected a Democratic governor 10 years ago. We hired a Republican one. They're so great. Minnesota's so great. Wisconsin's so bad. Well, Minnesota's not looking that great right now. That's all I'm gonna say. You know what I'm talking about. So this department has done, meaning you, not me, has done so much around DEI and it's not fluffy stuff. You know, I have a, the title of the slide is efforts. You know, we've, we've done a lot of different things in regarding health disparities. I, you know, I'll highlight a couple, but I can't cover them all. But I want to say a word about DEI specifically. And I'm not going to read the next slides because it's too tedious. I'll give you a brief summary. The chairs right now of this committee are Melody, who's on vacation, thank God she needs one, and Katie Sampine, and they both have done a beautiful job. Ellen started it. They're caring for the torch. And just the brief summary is the department has fully embraced the effort. The committee is large with representation from every aspect of our work. And we have it at a time where people can go. Like if you've noticed, there's an M&M &M once every six weeks or so where there's nobody there. Everybody's in DEI and I'm good with that. <clears throat> and so it's become part of our culture, the educational programs. I have learned so much. I mentioned to you that I used to just like focus on the New Yorker. Now I focus on what Luther Gaston sends me and what everybody else sends me and what DEI is saying. Because I mean, if anything, the last two years, I realized I've got a lot to learn. And again, multidisciplinary membership in the culture of the department, clear mission and goals. And just the work they're doing is fantastic. Like the contraceptive counseling on L and D for pregnant women in the framework of reproductive justice. And then we have a web page for God's sakes. Thank you, Jesus, Chad. Thank you. We have a web page and it's powerful. So there are so many angles on health disparities. We could, I mean, there's one that's really important to us though, and that is, well, they all are, but the rural urban problem. If you live in rural America, rural Wisconsin, your chance of dying young is a lot higher than if you live in an urban setting. And, you know, without looking at the facts, if you look at some of the care that is referred into us, both in Obey and GYN, you realize, wow, it's lonely out there. Um, just more, much more likely to die if you live in rural America. And I just had to throw this in there because there's this, I had no good place to put this slide in the talk. This is kind of pathetic, but it goes, this is a tangent. This thing about things dropping from the sky. Ellen mentioned that I was president of the SGO, mostly that was, a very challenging, many times unpleasant job. I've just got to admit that. But one of the perks was I got to pick the topic of the journal for the year, the special journal. So that wasn't hard. It was going to be health disparities. And that was just like a gift right from the sky for me. Uh, just one other thought about rural America. This is a funny little story. I'll tell it. I probably half of you already heard it, but this is about five or six years ago, maybe more. Craig Kent was the chair of surgery. He's making all those people go work in the emergency room out in, actually it's 45 minutes from here, not far. 
So it was a Saturday, Chip was covering the emergency room. This is not a source of happiness in our house. And he called, he said, how do you do a C-hiss? And I thought, oh my God. I said, what's going on? He said, I just got called to the operating room. The baby's out, the mother's bleeding, the family medicine doctor wants to do a hysterectomy. And I thought, can I go over there and help him? No, because I don't have privileges. But then yeah, I said, well, how much, you know, tell me more. He goes, well, the blood is in Iowa. There's no blood here. I mean, and he, he's a smart guy. He's a smart surgeon. He just packed and waited and he didn't have to do a hysterectomy. But the point I'm saying is that isn't exactly rural America, 45 minutes from here. Just saying. So back to Wisconsin. Many, many counties in this state do not have an obstetrician gynecologist. When you think about it, the family medicine doctors are our friends. They're out there on the front line. And in terms of physicians, the physician, the actual number in Wisconsin is going down, OBGYN doctors, and the female population is going up. Hmm. That's not good. So, we have the only rural residency spot in the United States. That's going to end soon because everybody's been bugging the hell out of Ryan Spencer to get the pith, and we just keep sending it, sending it, sending it. But Ellen was head of the residency and vice chair of education, which she still is. And the story is this. This is way too personal, but I find it humorous and also really makes me angry. So I'm going to share this with you. So it was like 5.30 in the morning. And Chip and I were in the bathroom brushing our teeth or some god awful thing. And he's like yapping about this rural residency thing. He just got approved with DHS, surgery, psych, pediatrics, and family medicine. I said, what? He goes, oh, yeah. We got, we got this whole little gig going where we have a rural residency now. The four programs do. I thought, why don't you, and I said, why don't you send me that pith? Let me take a look at it, just casually. Knowing in my heart of hearts I was totally going to steal it. And, and I did, and, and then Ellen and I got in cahoots, and we got a bunch of you, and we just like started working on it. We have the spot, we have ACG and the approval, we recruited a new resident, you know, a new resident spot, and it was launched. And Ryan Spencer, as you know, has taken it over with Jody and her team, and it is just a fabulous program, and it is meaningful. If you think about the state and the paucity of physicians out there in rural America, we can only control our little piece, which is OBGYN. But you know, like our first graduate is in rural Minnesota. I'm not going to hold that against her. And then, you know, we have people coming that are going to practice in rural America, be it well, Wisconsin or elsewhere. And, you know, Wisconsin's like a lot of states in the U.S. in terms of that rural thing. So that's a moment of happiness and continues to be. It's like good work, very good work. And here's the spots. You know, it takes a lot of work to identify the place. You gotta have the doctor that wants to work. You gotta have the hospital that wants to participate. And Ellen and I were completely creative about the money. I'm not even gonna say anything more about that. Creative, very, very creative. And um, we continue to have really good programs for our program, for our real program. Now, Jenny Karnowski and Spencer and I are in cahoots with the whole issue of this rural residency having a spot in a Native American reservation. This is a little bit tangential, so stay with me. We spent a decade and frankly, a lot of our money building a program in Ethiopia. They came here, we went there, we had courses. It was a program, not just doctors going to Ethiopia to do some work. Nothing wrong with that, but we wanted a program, and Cynthia Watlett did an amazing job. So obviously nobody's going to Ethiopia anytime soon, unless you haven't read the paper, it's a god awful civil war. And so, I mean, COVID is one thing, but civil war is like a whole other thing. So, you know, the concept of fulfilling our desire to have a global health rotation, and we all know you don't exactly have to leave the United States, you just don't. And so the Native American reservation thing is, is really gaining steam. And as was the case with Ethiopia, 
You can't just barge in. And as you know, I'm not the most patient person in the world. So I had to like totally dial it down and we're, we're getting to know the Native Americans up in this very specific, um, the Lac de Flambeau tribal clinic. It's going really well. I'm excited about it. But again, just kind of, and UW has got a big program. We're not doing this by ourselves. I mean, there's people here that have offices that work in this reservation. This is like, this is good. We're gaining steam with this. You know, I've said this a million times and I'm gonna say it again. The residency, and I'm not kissing up to you people, is the heart of the department. And the fact that this faculty, all of you, so solidly drive hard for the residents. I hope you know this program is impressive. I claim no credit. You know, I've been to other institutions. I've seen some stuff. This faculty continues to bring the heat for our residents. And the numbers here show. In 2010, we had 346 applicants. In 2020, we had 721. In 2010, the step score greater than or equal to 230, 38%, and it's now 85. I would never get into this residency if I had applied. So I just want to say that, because part of this, as you can probably already see, is this is a little bit of a reflection of my time here, and I am so grateful. Training the physicians of the future is just, uh, it's so much of a money item. And I'm not just speaking for myself, I'm speaking for the whole faculty. It's a thing of grace and beauty. And takes a lot of commitment. It's easy just to be fluffy with it. We're not fluffy. So let's go back to the theme, if there is one. So we got the rural residency thing going. It's fantastic. I love it. And now I'm going to talk about the rural residency in the context of reproductive rights and abortion. <sighs> I don't know, four years ago, I get a call from the dean. Still scares me. If he calls me, I get scared. And it was like, Laurel, the legislature is close. They got a bill. It's going to keep all UW employees from doing abortions anywhere or teaching anybody to do abortions. Now, abortions are legal, illegal at UW. Gloria Sarto can comment on that. That's a long story. But we have a good training program as it relates to abortion. And this legislation that was proposed was and still is 911. And so for the next, I don't know, several months, there was a war room mentality with the dean, lawyers, lobbyists. I was really impressed. You know, it's not like people walk around talking about abortion. I happen to do that, but that's part of my job, and I actually don't mind it. But Bob fully embraced it, as did all the lawyers, and it was it was like because they were they they it was past committee. It was moving on. And the workup to get to fighting this included many conversations with the ACGME, many conversations with the board, three or four programs like at Georgetown. What do they, because like the legislators were saying, oh, there's all kinds of programs that don't do abortions. They're silly. These people are lying. It was quite an experience. And this was, you know, this was in the news all the time. And the question, it's not even a question, it was so crafty, because it's true. It's always helpful if it's true. This issue of a shortage of OB doctors in the state of Wisconsin, that was our bully pulpit, as well as the fact that we couldn't, because we can't have a residency. The ACGME sent a letter that said you would, you know, if they don't have a way to train residents to do abortions, then what will happen here is citations and probable you know, removal of the residency program. That was quite a day. First, the first part of that whole meeting down there was them attacking the dean's wife, who does fetal cell research. I don't know what she does, but wherever it is, they attacked her. And then we went into the whole, you know, abortion thing, which we did convincingly take care of. Came up again a couple, three months ago, we were back down there again, same thing. 
And um, I just want to say that advocacy in women's health, it's like putting on your big girl and boy pants. And it's not just about abortion. Like Bhagavad, God bless him. He's like going to get it done. There's going to be insurance coverage for infertility care in the state of Wisconsin. God damn, that guy is tenacious. And then I'm looking at Greg, Luther, and McCabe. And all I can tell, I'm looking at Greg, his blood pressure is going up, I can tell you right now. So we, we spent three years about this issue of it not being okay for patients to say they don't want a black doctor. They don't want a boy. They don't want this. They don't want that. We, you know, we got it across the finish line. Of course, it's, at one point, Greg and I had to call up Ellen and tell her to take torch because nobody wanted to hear from us anymore. That was sure true. Because it was like, Aah! and um, so efficacy in our field. And there's so many, many, many examples. Heidi Brown has made the world realize that women pooping and peeing on themselves is actually not okay. And that we can talk about it and work on it. You know, there's no shortage of advocacy opportunity in women's health. There just is not. So back to core a little bit. So, you know, this thing about testifying, you know, I still feel like, I mean, I'm not practiced. I mean, it was hard and still is hard. But part of the research being done by Jenny is the role of expert testimony in Wisconsin reproductive health legislation. I got a lot of help from a lot of people. Now, as it turns out, they didn't want to hear anything I had to say. It was all about the dean and his wife. But I was prepared. I was prepared, and I will continue to be prepared. So, and again, you can tell I'm doing a little wandering here. Ellen mentioned clinical trials. Clinical trials. Hmm. How did I get interested in that? Well, let's go back to thalidomide. This is a drug that was used to treat pain and whatever in pregnant women. They didn't sleep well, give them some thalidomide. Greater than 10,000 babies were born with heart abnormalities and focomelia, which is no arms or legs or... None of those babies were born in the United States. When I was growing up, we got two germs at my house. One was life, which is defunct. The other was National Geographic. This was one of these pictures was on the cover of life. I'll never forget it. I was, I don't know, in grade school. It was like, how could that happen? This is Frances Kelsey. She got her MD PhD from the University of Chicago. So interesting. The only reason she got in was because they thought she was a boy. That's just a kind of a tangential thought, but it's like the Chris Pat Francis thing, you know. Anyway, she graduated, went up to the Dakotas for 20 years with her husband and two children, and then for some reason decided to go to DC and work for the FDA. She had a PhD in pharmacology. Her very first assignment was to review the application for, for, for thalidomide. It had been approved all over the planet. And the pharmaceutical industry, even then, was formidable. She held the line. And boy, heroin indeed. None of those babies were born in the United States. She won the presidential honor. It was a big deal. And um, I cut it out because I felt like I had too many slides, but. I religiously read the obituaries in the New York Times, not because I'm morbid, but because it's just so fascinating, people's lives. And a few years ago, she was one of the obituaries in the New York Times, and it's a fascinating story. Fascinating life. She never got fired from the FDA. Talk about job security. She worked till she was like 95. Well, what can I say about that? So clinical trials and women. A little bit of history. The Harvard Physicians Health Study, 22,000 men, no women. Multiple risk factor intervention trial, 15,000 men, no women. Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Normal Human Aging, just men. But we have the Nurses Health Study, now of course, level three versus level one. I mean, this is an observational study compared to a clinical trial, you know, 
that was controlled, et cetera. So that isn't right. And um, the reason I, I kind of got going on this, this is a funny little story. It's in the office, this is when I was at UVA, and I was taking care of a fair number of benign gynecology patients, the wife of the anesthesia department, which was not good. I mean, like, why should I be doing that? From a clinical practice perspective, and she brought this paper, and actually, it was yeah, it was a newspaper showing the first result from the Women's Health Initiative, and um, the fact that I had her on some hormones that I shouldn't have had her on, and so, needless to say, I went out and googled the Women's Health Initiative and realized I thought, oh, that's cool. It's a big NIH study just for women. Isn't that fantastic? And then over the years, I've realized there's a saga behind that. And the saga is, oh, I'll get to it. So I started getting interested in clinical trials. I wrote this paper with Marcella Del Carmen about the underrepresentation of women in clinical trials in general. Obviously, it had a GYN oncology focus, but it, that this paper started a long, fruitful writing relationship with Marcella, and she's a dear friend. I can tell you about that if I have time. In the story with clinical trials in women. I have like 20 slides, and it's a story that I don't have enough time, but the, basically, the legislature three, four, five times has dictated to the NIH that they have to have equal representation of women in clinical trials. And every time they do it, the Institute of Medicine or the National Academy of Medicine dictates to the NIH, you have to do this. And when Bill Clinton was elected in 93, it was actually some legislation was passed, but it continues to be a struggle. Um, this was published a couple of years ago. It's still a struggle. This paper was published by Francis Collins, who's stepping down as the NIH, and the whole thrust of this paper is that the lack of reproducibility um, in basic science is because, you know, we're just using male cell lines. We use, need to use more female cell lines. There's different themes on this whole problem, but it's far from resolved. And here's an example of a demand for the NIH, and they said they would do it. Even popular science is in on it. This is a few years old. Women are being excluded from clinical trials. So, you know, I'm not happy with that. And then if you get back to my little wheelhouse of GYN ecology, this is telling, there's a crisis, 90% reduction in phase three trial patient enrollment and a 68% reduction in available trials. This is a little old data, it's like five years old, but this is what got the whole thing moving for me. Because we know that the way you improve healthcare is excellent clinical care, excellent education, excellent research, and excellent advocacy. And this, for GYN oncology, as well as for actually the whole field, and I'll get to that, was really disturbing to me. So I just want to talk about this paper that Ryan Spencer drove. There's a few other people involved with it. Disparities in the allocation of research funding to GYN cancers by funding to lethality. It's just a math thing. I'll explain it in a minute. So they want to see, is it equitable? Is the NIH given equitable funding to different cancers? So when you think about this, you have to think about incidence, mortality, and years of life lost. For example, breast cancer is really common. Not as many women die of breast cancer. Lung cancer is much more common in terms of death. In terms of years of life lost, that is self-explanatory. So the, met, the funding to lethality ratio, it's a way to standardize the impact of those three variables. The data collection was very slick. Mortality and incident data from the SEER registry, which is all we got in the United States, it's not like we're Scandinavia. Years of life loss per cancer death, NCI data, and funding NCI data. So mortality divided by incidence, equals cancer burden on a population, and then you take into consideration person of years, person years life lost, and turn that into a ratio. And you can come up with this lethality thing. So we're comparing ovary to prostate cancer here. 
And the mortality to incident ratio for ovary cancer going right to the bottom is 0.618 and it's 0.192 for prostate. So more women die of ovarian cancer than men die of prostate cancer. And then if you take into consideration years of life lost and funding, how much the NIH spends. It's 85K per year of life lost to 1.1 per prostate. It's compelling. I mean, it's just two cancers, but the story is compelling. And then if you look at the last seven years, funding for ovary, cervix, and uterus are right at the bottom. Lots of strengths. I've already highlighted them. Reliable data. Trends easy to observe. And there's, there are weaknesses. Not all research funding comes from the NCI, but the biggest funder for research in this country is the NIH. Let's not have any misunderstanding. And, you know, unable to determine the contribution of cooperative groups. I'm not going to go into detail on that and the funding gaps. But the summary statement is, is it's not equitable. My fantasy, I was so excited about this. I thought, oh, this is definitely going to get picked up by the New York Times. This is big. This is like, oh, sweet Jesus, this is huge. Well, not so much the case. I don't even know what this journal is. God bless Ryan, but you know, isn't he cute as button in there? So the point being, it continues to be a struggle. Every single person in this room cares about women's health and research is critical to drive it forward. Now, Ellen mentioned the American Gynecologic Obstetric Society. What that is, is a whole group of people from every walk of our field. And they're usually old people, let's just be honest. It's gotten younger, but people, you know, division chiefs, chairs, et cetera. So it's a group of people that have a lot of experience. And when I was president of this organization, I got this thing going, WFRC, Women's First Research Coalition, which is still going big guns. All these groups, meaning all of your groups are in, they pay money for our lobbyists, and they are helping drive forward this issue of inadequate funding by the NIH. And we're working with the Hill, we're working with the NIH, and People are starting to, we even have our own stationary, which is mission critical. So the point is, this is an ongoing thing. And when I think about this department, I think about our researchers, our people that are funded by the NIH. Manish and his whole group, they're all back there. I see them back there. Heidi, Lisa, Alex, Kara, the list is long. It makes me angry that they are not being treated as people in internal medicine are being treated in terms of funding. And it's true. This is a paper that a bunch of us wrote regarding that, that departments of OBGYN do not have equal NIH funding when you look at all the other, depart all the other departments. It's hard to get to good data, but this paper has good data, I'm just saying. So I feel passionate about this. And it's like the advocacy thing. It's like the patient care thing, the research and education thing. All of that elevates care for women here and elsewhere. So, in, let me just wrap this up. This is obviously a talk that's been a little bit wandering, but it leads me to say to you what an honor and pleasure it's been to work here. I've had the opportunity to pursue the stuff that I think is important with you. And I, I'm just so very, very grateful. Our mission is thought about every day. We may not read it, we may not, we don't have it, we used to have it laminated, but you know, I really admire this department. And again, I've been around the block. And I know that this is a gem, and whoever comes here to take my place is really lucky. Far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. And we all have that. And I wish I could say to you that I see a horizon where 
the good work we have to do will lessen. I don't see that. I think it's escalating. And this is the department that can make a difference. The traje your trajectory as a group is scary. It's so good. People are rowing so hard on all four pillars, it, it kind of in the face of adversity. I mean, COVID, just the whole world right now feels adverse. It feels good to me to think about our little wheelhouse, which is women's health. And I want to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.